All right, we're live right now with the Philosophy of Art and Science show here. And today I am blessed to be joined by my good friend Armando Yi Jr., a.k.a. Armando Yi Rodriguez. He really needs no introduction for some of you, but for those of you who don't know him, this is the man, the man who brought me on as a co-writer on his show, Buenas Noches Pepperdine. He is a producer. He is a sorcerer slash magician. He is a practitioner of the dark arts, you may say. He is a stand-up comedian. He is a balloon sculptor and or twister however you would like to define it he's an entrepreneur he ran his own recruiting company him and i worked in the another person's recruiting company together we also worked in raising money at our university where we met and above all we are both the children of beautiful immigrant parents in southern california with the same birthday as Whoopi goldberg buenas noches armando how are you <laughs> Hello, thank you very much for that uh very grandiose introduction. I really appreciate it. Nothing beats, by the way, though, Hanok, your Diablo skills, though. Out of all those things, I feel like I really respect your Diablo skills. Not to mention you speaking the good word on Saturdays and Sundays, man, to a lot of kids, a lot of adults that need to hear the, uh, to hear the good word. Thank you for having me on here, Hanok. It's a real honor. Uh, I look forward to conversing with you about uh, certain topics. But uh, thank you, and it's, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here uh, being conversing with you such an esteemed diabolist more more importantly and not to mention a good uh, great interviewer too i know you and i both created that uh segment on buenas noches pepperine by the way for those of you that don't know is a tv show in college that we had henok and i uh, and many other people but it entertained the malibu community for uh, i would say close to two years we have 28 episodes and in those 28 episodes henok with diablo it's a skill with uh, two sticks and a yo-yo like uh, tool i guess and uh, he was well known. It was called Hanok's Hustle, a great episode. But uh, overall, Hanok, thank you for having me. Thank you. And you brought up already, I think, <laughs> one of the reasons why you and I got along so well is that obviously besides, you know, having the kind of salient identity markers that are that are similar and maybe even eerily similar and ending up in the same sweet freshman year in one of the only dormitories at Pepperdine University that was not assigned a white man's name from a donation and one of the only dorms that did not have a spiritual life advisor uh, mm -hmm. while other dorms did and regarding that spirituality i want to thank you for your openness to various types of spirituality armando i i, I want only god alone to to receive the glory for what you have done but i have to speak facts you know i have to call a spade a spade and armando has come and participated both in the late night midnight masses as well as the early morning masses or liturgies of the ethiopian orthodox church our services are brutal even amongst the orthodox he's come before from 6 p.m to 1 a.m he's also And I remember the time I told him to come at four, I was serious about that time. And he came around 4.15 or 4.30 and he apologized for being late. And he looked around and it was not that many people in attendance at that early hour. And I said, man, you're late according to the schedule, but you're relationally way earlier than everybody else. So I commend you for that yeah. and for bringing up these juxtapositions, these paradoxes that make us. So he referred to me being a diabolist as well as a preacher of the word. Those things may surprise you because the Greek word Diablo originally means slanderer and it's used to refer to the devil, of course, and in our language. That's the word, the words diabolical and things like that come. But the Chinese named a yo-yo Diablo, just like a lot of places name their hot sauce Diablo, and it's not necessarily the hellfire, but they're just trying to say it's spicy. The Chinese have a very interesting yo-yo that I first came across in studying the, the Chinese women of Circus Soleil, and that I came across in a program at, at my at my middle school as well. And I, I did pretty well at it, especially a technique called grinding. And you can see that on Buenas Noches Pepperdine, which I believe some of the episodes are, are they still up on YouTube? Yes, the, the people can YouTube them, Buenas Noches Pepperdine, or simply Henok Elias, Henok's Hustle. I would highly recommend anyone that has a spare moment at all. If you have one spare moment, please uh, type in YouTube Henok's Hustle to see Henok Elias Nagash, Awata, your host today, in action. 
very impressive moves. Hanok, I got to tell you some of the finest Diabloing I've ever seen. And I've seen a couple of Cirque du Soleil. So very impressive. I got to tell you, Hanok. Uh, and I put you on the spot by asking for your permission to repost them on my page just to facilitate them watching that great program. I would be insulted, Hanok, if you didn't post them on your page. In fact, I think it's long overdue. That's a phenomenal idea. Thank you for that. And let's not forget, by the way, that you're also a phenomenal chess player, Hanok. That's something that not only, by the way, I was re recently watching, there's a phenomenal documentary on Amazon about Monopoly. I was watching that documentary and I thought, boy, Hanok Nagash and I have had some great Monopoly games. There's Monopoly tournaments, there's world championships. I bet you'd go pretty far in a Monopoly World Championship panel. Can you, uh, let me, I, I don't want to push you into a place where you're not comfortable, but I, I do want to ask if you can share any anecdotes of some of the, the many, let's say, polemical chess games. Chess games have not been as polemical. Chess games have been more fun, I think, between you and I. And Armando is a great chess player himself. The difference is, you know, I have more experience in timed exercises. So sometimes Armando will take a little longer on his moves, but he's, he really is a good chess player. And I don't just toot people's horns. Like he's, he's, he's up there. And I've recently been spanking my cousin, Jonathan and, and my, my friend Rostin and posting it on Instagram, but I've, I've, I've lost too. Um, but I always, you know, win more than I lose in that exercise. I've always considered myself intelligent in terms of strategy. Some people thought I've been book smart, but my grades have not always been there. Sometimes they've been subpar, even in grad school and, and undergrad, but I always did enough to get by. And I think where my actual intelligence is that I would take pride is in strategic games, mano y mano, man versus man, hand to hand. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that. And, and thank you again for granting me permission to repost and telling me that you'd be insulted were I not to post. That really is the right attitude. I wish more people had gratitude as the right attitude like uh, you had. So could you share any anecdotes about Monopoly games that you and I have had? And even risky games have been funny too. Absolutely. For the viewers out there, uh, you may or may not know. You probably do know that Hanok is a game master. He really is uh, well, uh, well developed in terms of game as, as he mentioned it right now time chess. I remember you were extremely adroit at a game of dice. You really know how to throw those dice, and I got to tell you. I once lined up about 20 mostly white men and uh, went up on the day 200 plus when oh. at one point I was down 600. Oh, God, goodness gracious. I mean, that is some impressive dice playing to be down $600 and come back in. I almost went negative 1200. We we're going double or nothing. I mean, that is a very impressive. Oh, that is a testament to your skills. <laughs> but anyway. You may remember our, our French friend, uh, Jeremy Sibon, the professor, yeah. the Commodore. Yeah. He, yeah. he was telling the guy, Mech, Mech, please, please take this man's money. You're up 600. Stop. You're an addict. Please stop rolling the dice. Don't be addicted. And the guy goes, Mech, but what if he owes me 1,200? Yeah, I mean, and that's an important question. I mean, how important is it to be good at dice? That's something. And for those of you that don't know the game the rules of dice are quite simple you simply roll i believe it's one or two dice and whoever has the higher number of wins essentially is that correct i think that's right so we were playing a modified version where you just get seven so okay. the first person to get seven is what we were doing when mm -hmm. i've played in vegas before they played with slightly different rules like uh, you you either bet on the house or you bet against the house so mm -hmm. if you bet that you're going to win you you aim to get either a seven or 11 on the first time. If yeah. you bet that you're going to lose, you bet that you're trying to get doubles before you get seven or 11. And, and there are a bunch of intricate side bets and stuff. I remember people getting pissed off one time when, again, I made 200 bucks in Vegas. So in a more formalized matter. And uh, I, I made it by betting against everyone, including myself. And the people around me were appalled. They're like, why would you bet against yourself? I'm like, hey, the house yeah. wins. Holy smoke. Goodness gracious. I mean, that does prove you're a master of games. Uh, going back to your question, by the way, about any memorable Monopoly games that you and I have enjoyed, I, I just recall that you are very good at trades. You really had some creative trades that I had ever in my, you know, in my life, in my adult, young adult life. I've never seen any types of trades. One distinct trade that I remember, I believe it was uh, a hard physical property. I believe you wanted to potentially trade a property or a house, or you wanted to maybe get it out of paying a rent somehow, but you were able to uh, essentially sell some sort of gaseous substance for that particular item. I think it was a property that you wanted to trade a, 
a gas for something. And, and we did, in fact, uh, finalize the transaction for that. It was quite the special trade. That, that yeah, that, that was right. I think I was able to purchase a get out of jail free card by farting. That, to put it simply, yes. I mean, I was very, very intrigued by the concept. And at the time, I think that there was just a spare get out of jail free card that somebody had in the work deal, but it was because of your creative uh, deal making, to be honest with you. So I yeah, would to go back to the word of God. Sorry to cut you off. To go back yeah. to the word of God, I believe one of the sneakier techniques or trades that I had that used to really frustrate people, our, our good mutual friend Bear and I remember uh, looked at me never the same. I had another friend Jordan who never looked at me the same. The people who I was with in DC never looked at me the same after these deals when they realized the gravity of the error of making a deal with me. And that deal is around the resurrection of the dead. That's the concept of the resurrection of the dead that usually you see in chess as we were talking about, when the pawn respawns to get a queen, a rook, a knight, or a bishop, the holy man. But people aren't usually accustomed to seeing the resurrection of the dead within Monopoly. So mm -hmm. the way I entered into it is the only way you can, which is contractually. So yeah. what I would say to people is I would, I would amass through more typical deals a certain amount of wealth. And I wouldn't necessarily be the best, but I'd be top three almost every time in the normal, just a normal way of doing things. Mm -hmm. But then I would be creative and think outside the box and right. I would approach either the richest or the second richest. Usually the second richest is more interested. And I would say, how would you like me to give you all of my property for all of your tens, fives and ones for the rest of the game? And sometimes I would begin by saying all of your twenties, tens, fives and ones for the rest yeah. of the game. And it seems innocuous, meek and simple at the time. And they're like, you know what? You're going to give me all your property, all of my property. And I'd have like all the railroads or all the electricity, the utility stuff, or I'd have something good, you know, like the, the, the blues, the Navy blues or something. And they'd be like, they would be so greedy that they wouldn't think critically about what I was saying. And they would take my property. And after they've amassed wealth, they find out later in the game that what this means is that they can never beat me. Yes, that's that a good because they have to always pay me their tens, fives, and ones, they're going to have to go through so many transactions that they either have to overpay people with their 50s, 100s, and 500s, which will bankrupt them quickly, or or they have to just keep paying me an unlimited amount of money. And that's yeah. what they don't realize that they signed on the dotted line. And so what these people typically do is they typically end up in spite. If they moved rationally just for their own self-interest, they would get second place. But instead, what they typically do is they make a ridiculous deal and just give all their property away to somebody else so that somebody else could beat me. I mean, I can tell you've had experience with this deal. So you've done you've conducted this deal a couple of times. There have been a couple of people that must have been shocked by it. If you look at my Instagram profile, friend, it says scientist because I firmly believe in the scientific method. So I've experimented this on many other people and <laughs> there are many victims of this deal. What is their reaction? I mean, because this is a shocking deal. Like I, I, I remember my reaction. I was a gas. I couldn't believe it. What, uh, what, what was it happening? The first, the yeah. first typical reaction is shock and <laughs> just a loss of speech in a genuine sense. They literally do not know what to say. The mm -hmm. second reaction is an accusation of cheating to which I've read the manual. I know the manual very well. I know the rules very well. To your point about me being a master of games, what makes me good at games is I have an almost autistic level of genius, uh, an idiot savant level of genius in terms of following the logic of rules mm. without any regard for people's feelings. My mm. sisters are anti-competition and more interested in the sentiment or the feeling of the game. I'm mm. more interested in defeating my opponent my with the rule set within the rules. I don't bend any rules. I don't cheat. I'm very much someone obedient to the rules, but I find the logic limit of that, the edge of the rules. And I like to dance on that. Mm -hmm. I'm very Machiavellian, would you say? I mean, that sounds certainly- very... Yeah, I appreciate Machiavelli. You and I both read Machiavelli and he's becoming more and more relevant. In fact, yeah. the- gentleman Curtis Yarvin, who is my highest viewed video that I interviewed, is a Machiavellian. He's writing a book right now called A Gray Mirror for Princes, mm -hmm. which is in the genre of uh, gray mirrors, which were this medieval genre where people would write how-to guides of how to be a good ruler as a prince. Mm -hmm. Machiavelli's comes much later, and his is 
more um, not a how to rule, but how to get to be the person ruling. But mm -hmm. prior to him, the genre was usually assuming you were already in power. How do you mm -hmm. rule justly? Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I didn't know. So, so there are different accounts, historical accounts of rulers explaining how to be effective rulers, essentially, how to lead the people. What is another example? I mean, King Henry or what, what are we, what's a good example? Pope? Uh, besides the Machiavellian how to, can you think of one or um, one off, of off the top of my head? No, but I could uh, find it out. I think it's called Mirrors for Princes is the genre. Let me see right now. So mirror, yeah, here it is. There, the genre is called Mirrors for Princes. Mirror, okay. interesting. Yeah. So if you go to Britannica, mm -hmm. you know, a phenomenal encyclopedia, mm -hmm. um, I'll quote for them right now. Mirror for Princes also called mirrors <laughs> i don't know why they repeat that mirror for princes is a genre of advice literature that outlines basic principles of conduct for rulers and of the structure and purpose of secular power often yeah. in relation either to a transcendental source of power or to abstract legal norms as a yeah. genre the mirror for princes has its roots in the writings of the ancient greek historian xenophon it mm. flourished in Western Europe, beginning in the early Middle Ages, as well as in the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world. Wow, phenomenal. That is, uh, I did mirrors for princes, then. That is a genre of literature. Because I was going to say, the Bible does speak of Solomon, King Solomon, but it's not from his perspective, is it? Is there no, no, it wouldn't be from his perspective. Um, he, he's he's a, a very mistaken figure. Mm. You know, he's a very mistaken figure. Please, My don't. own ancestors claim lineage from him, and wow. a lot of people try to boast in the wisdom of Solomon. Yeah. But it's dangerous because the man also had about 800 mistresses or side uh, hoes, and uh, mm -hmm. that's not the wisest thing to do. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that could be problematic. That there, I remember the famous tale of uh, a woman bringing a boy to Solomon, and the please share that account with us if you please. I would love to hear it from you. Well, the, well, I'll tell you the brief story the, from what I remember. The lady was claiming ownership over the son, and there were two women that were essentially fighting over the ownership of the son, if I'm not mistaken. Solomon decides to resolve this by essentially cutting the baby in half and giving one half to each lady. Um, but what does that tell us about humans? So he does not decide to do it. Mm -hmm. It's a test. He says, let's do it to exactly. see the reaction of the two mothers. Mm. And the one who is the genuine mother is horrified by the idea and says, mm. no, I would rather give the baby up. Whereas the one who it's, doesn't have what Nassim Taleb would refer to as skin in the game, skin mm -hmm. in the game is a very biblical context mm. and word and phrase, turn of phrase. And he says, uh, I'm gonna give it to the one who's horrified, not to the one who said, okay. And actually, this is another good point that I always make to my Sunday school students. The vast majority of idioms in the English language come from the King James Bible, whether you love it or not. I've had friends, you know, quote, for example, the Good Samaritan and mm -hmm. other things like that without realizing they're talking about biblical concepts, right? Mm -hmm. And so splitting the baby is Split. the term, right? And splitting the baby, that's biblical language. That's what, he's a snake. I'm sure that's biblical as well, referring to the treacherous snake of the Garden of Eden. Eden, excuse me. Uh, that's we, right. That's yeah. right. And that's a great segue to a, a story where my old roommate mm -hmm. and uh, and you, who've had some interesting kerfuffles <laughs> in the first week of being uh, my roommate, yeah. was watching me play a game of pool. Now, you and I used to have this concept we used to push called ignorance we even had a team called team ignorance and we were known in the pool hall areas as people who know how to make opponents lose rather than who know how to win now you and i had some uh, a modicum of, of skill at, at winning i think yours is a little bit better than mine but uh, you adopted this policy uh when i introduced it to you you, th you thought it was genius and you you were my great collaborator and i remember we had good friends uh, that would participate and they called themselves team dominance. We were team ignorance. And one of the early forms of, of team ignorance was me on my own against a good Romanian friend of ours who was very talented at winning in a classical way. And what a lot of Western Americans could not fathom 
is that this Eastern man who's at the border of the East and the West in Romania had a strong, deep sense in the idea of honor that a lot of people don't have. And so <laughs> when I played against him, we bet money. And when we bet money, I didn't do this intentionally, but my, my goal was to make him lose. And so on my first actual hit, when I broke for the pool set, I scratched, which means I <laughs> lose. And he could not stand that. So people around it were like, no, 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 that doesn't count. So he made it, he made us, uh, I think, try to reset and all these things. But instead of resetting and playing him, I said, no, you won fair and square. And I paid him because I knew about honor, because I come from a society of honor as well. And I knew yeah. he wouldn't accept it. So he oh. takes my money and he throws it back at me. He says, do you insult me? He's like, I don't need your money. I need to show that I'm better than you at pool. And I was like, yeah. well, you showed that you were better. He's like, no, no, no. And he goes outside to smoke a cigarette. Mm -hmm. I go to pick up one of the $5 bills. While mm -hmm. I go to pick up the second $5 bill, my fresh new roommate picks up that bill. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm giving it back to that guy. He deserves it. And he goes outside and he gives it to that man who then fuming mad at his honor being shoved in his face takes it and burns it <laughs> and there's a, a lot of debate about <laughs> whether that's a good idea or not and in that was moment dollar or was it in romanian currency what was the it was dollars or what i don't want to get too much into the specifics because i don't know about the legality of all that <laughs> uh, hypothetically speaking so yeah. anyway he he does this and i look at my roommate who we've only been roommates for about a week and i said friend, you've made a, a poor decision. I live with you. And uh, this was, uh, I wasn't pre-Christian at the time, but I was, I was less committed to Christianity at the time and more interested maybe in alternative spiritual uh, activities. And one of those is uh, what I learned from Tupac, that revenge is a dish best served cold. And uh, he, he knows that, you know, and it's the sweetest thing next to cats. So mm -hmm. he knows that. And yes. I, I told him that he was in trouble and he was very dismayed. His anxiety started rising. And remember, we don't have a spiritual life advisor. So point. we go to the nearest spiritual life advisor we have in the next door dormitory. When we go to that dormitory, we gather all these people who are there because they used to have the chillest dormitory. If you remember, cats like Albert and stuff, they used to have video games and a nice couch and everything. Yeah, and we go there and I say, the only way I'll make a amends, the only way I'll make peace and reconciliation with you is if you get a man paid to be a spiritual life advisor to call you a treacherous snake in front of people. Goodness and so we go in there and poor Timco, that high-pitched spiritual life advisor, he uh, is talking with us and he's like, guys, I, I, I don't know if it's appropriate for me in my position. It goes against my. So what happened is we, we, we brought a moral and ethical quandary to him. We said, look, man, we have both agreed. You don't even have to make us agree to something. You don't have to have us negotiate. We've already agreed the terms of the reconciliation. All you have to do is break your sense of purity and innocence and call this man a treacherous snake. So then the crowd begins chanting, treacherous snake, treacherous snake treacherous snake and then tim go poor spiritual life advisor that is he goes you're a treacherous snake and then i'm relieved and i said okay now we're at peace and it was a hilarious episode so i wanted to get your take sorry for that long monologue but what was your yeah. take on that whole incident my whole monologue well no that was not a, that was extremely short I, I would love to hear more details of that but what i was going to say i was surprised that we did in fact gather a crowd for that there was a I couldn't believe it. There were people interested in what was going on between that spiritual life advisor and poor uh, your roommate, who who was getting in some ways a, a spiritual reprimand, so to say, from uh, for giving a man money that <laughs> was at, at stake. So it was a very interesting episode. That does bring me to this question, though, for you, Hannah. How often are you thinking about these instances? Because there's a couple of moments in your time at Pepperdine that really shaped you. Uh, that being one of them. The other one when you were, of course, a Diabloist on BNP and you being part of the, that television show. How often do you think back to those significant moments uh, at, at Pepperdine, at, um, around campus, you know? And is there one in particular that really transformed you? Uh, in so, a so I'll tell you this. 
Yeah. And and sorry to zoom out and to put it in such such a framing, but this is just to help you out. You introduced yeah. me to the phrase years ago, out of sight, out of mind. And I really, I really vibed with that saying that you taught me amongst many sayings that you've taught me. You laugh, but I'm serious. It was really something I could tangibly trace back to you amongst mm -hmm. other things. And um, I can tell you that I have been in various environments. And so a lot of times I don't even think about these things unless I'm with someone that recalls that memory. You and I both have phenomenal senses of smell and we know the, the sense of smell, the olfactories are the greatest sense tied to memory. So sometimes it might be a scent that brings back that, that memory. Please don't deny it. And I know you won't. Um, so when I grew up in Van Nuys, I was looking at some pictures the other day. I grew up in an incredibly diverse area. Just to give you one example, um, I was at a magnet school, a pub, my local public school. And my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Inouye, was someone who was a Japanese uh, little girl who was interned in the internment camps or concentration camps of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm. Wow. Oh, Most wow. of the white peers I had were of Jewish background, and they were the minority alongside the blacks and the Asians, and the largest group were Hispanics and amongst the Hispanics, it was majority Mexican. And that's mm. the neighborhood I grew up in. Later, when I went to a private Christian middle school, I began being around more white folks. And then in mm. high school, an extreme amount, where at one point I was the only black man. And oh so God. those environments are the ones that then drew me into Pepperdine. And mm -hmm. I, I began the beginning of Pepperdine more and more around white folks. But towards the end, to be honest, just by happenstance, I spent more time with my Hispanic friends who I vibed with because we spoke more than one language. We're not like this monolingual American culture and we have the shared children of immigrant or immigrant experience along with my black folks who have the shared experience of, of being black. After mm -hmm. graduating, I would spend most of my time in predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods Mm -hmm. but then also spent an inordinate amount of time with Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. So by virtue of the increasingly changing demographics of my circle, I don't think about these things often. But because you're a remnant of those things, when I'm with you, it's it's as if I get a scent of you, even through this digital realm, and these <laughs> memories come flashing back to me. And I, again, I have a phenomenal memory. You really do. You really do. And, and that is also well applied in, in terms of your Bible studies and all the biblical information. I remember I often uh, call you when I have any questions. We, I just, you and I just spoke about Jeremiah not too long ago. You revealed what a uh, important prophet that gentleman was. We spoke about Moses and parting of the Red, uh, Red Sea, certainly very important moments in the Bible. Uh, but overall, I got to tell you, Hanuk, it was a wonderful time at Pepperdine and certainly a lot was learned. My, I think a lot. I learned a lot from that TV show, really, because I, I guess I've been in the control room in TV since uh, since 2008 when I got into school. So it's, it's just can you tell us the specifics of how you pitched the idea of the television program? What where where people yeah. were able to access it at the time? Who the supervisor was, and practically like what kind of budget you got? I mean, there was very minimal budget. There was a minimal budget and. Uh, Certainly, there was, there was minimal budget, really. I wasn't doing it for the budget. I was doing it for simply because I wanted a different show. There were four different Well, I shows. mean, including like the, the, the level of the and the quality of the equipment, you know, the calidad. I'm trying oh, to say I mean, more. I mean, in terms of quality of studio quality, I mean, you, you saw the set. It was a full on new set. It was three cameras, phenomenal professional lighting. We had a control room, a full control room at use. I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars per episode, probably, if you were to quantify that now in. Now that I'm in the real working world, we were using a big stage too. It wasn't like a little small stage. It was a big stage. It was professional news had been shot there. Um, and, and what was, what was, how would you pitch the show, like describing the show? Because you were also at one point a weatherman and you were also at one point an anchor. And, yeah. and those are, you know, I would at least say, you know, not to be offensive, but more quote unquote serious in the eyes of some people roles, whereas this one had a little bit of satire, but how, how would you describe the show? 
Thank you for leading me on to that question. That's absolutely right. So I, I did. I was coming from a hard news background. I was the. I was an anchor. I was a newsman. But I, I'm not too serious in all honesty. You know, I like to joke around. I like to laugh. I like to make others laugh if possible. So that was my angle. And at the time, you could work in as part of the TV production program. An extracurricular activity was to join, whether it be a comedy sketch show or there was a late night man waves, it was called. There was another late night show, but it was all about men, basically, man waves. Um, and at the time, it was the John Stewart's were popular. It was uh, the, the precursor to the Stephen Colbert type of show. It was late night daily news. And so I said, you know what, with this studio setup, I think there could be a late night talk show similar to the daily show with john stewart so that was my kind of pitch this is the daily show with john stewart tailored for pepperdine hosted by a latino man let's call it buenas noches pepperdine which the name probably came to me but i immediately reached out to you and i said you know who will be a funny individual here that i can throw around ideas and i can know can execute and i elias nagash came to mind the diablos the joke master the game master and then we spun off and did that fantastic interview that i I hope you post some of those uh, episodes as well because you came up with that brilliant idea. And yeah, so I love that you meant. So you're mentioning some ideas that we implemented, but yeah. you know there were also ideas we didn't implement. I remember the first idea I pitched to Armando that just made him so shook was I said, "What if we have an all women of color cast?" <laughs> and <laughs> you had and time. I think that would be outstanding. I think right now is the most important time to have that that was very ahead of your time very nice. I, I was ahead of my time i was thinking but at the time you know i was with dream dramatically reconstructing education through african-american men it was an attempted nonprofit type with me and some other black men where we were doing events to raise money for black men to be part of scholarships and sometimes there was a women of color club that mm -hmm. we would collaborate with and you know there was also the the black student union at pepperdine who we would collaborate with sometimes too so you know, it was ahead of my time, but I was also a product of my time. You know, it was, sure. I didn't make these ideas up. I saw that and I said, you know, it, it would be interesting. You know, it'd be interesting to to have that because like you said, there's an all man show and there's yeah. so many different other avenues if we were able to to give, you know, women. And we, we had a lot of great women uh, on our on our show who later went on to do great things in entertainment. And, you know, whenever whenever I see, I ran into Kayla the other day, actually, uh, maybe a year year and a year year and a half ago at an all-black party in hollywood and mm -hmm. i caught her on her on the way out and you know i always remind her every time like <laughs> it was bmp that got you <laughs> well, in to this i mean believe it or not we were on youtube back then we were on youtube in 2010 youtube was somewhat new i don't think it was still owned by google back then it was just in that process so in many ways being on youtube that early on in some ways we were a little bit on the pulse of things even back because right now youtube is uh I'm very, very hot now, but even back then it was just, it was hot back then, but it was just starting to get so mainstream like it is now. And yeah, uh, when I'm, when I'm yeah. self-critical, um, Gary V himself hopped on in 08. So just a little bit before we did mm -hmm. and, and the difference between, for example, us and Gary V is that he stayed yeah doing the output the production he stayed the, he maintained the consistency and that's how he blew up first was with his wine show on youtube mm -hmm. so when i'm critical of myself it's not that we weren't open to things i owned bitcoin in 2011 you know what oh. i mean oh, and I, I ended up giving it away i donated some of it and i made some purchases with mm -hmm. some other it but Good. you know had i held on to it i bought less than like a hundred dollars worth and that less than a hundred dollars worth was at one point worth around four thousand that's yeah. a ridiculous, you know, ROI or return on interest. But you and I, I think, have this really high trait openness where we're just down to try a, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, like the man, the myth, the, the legend, Chris Simpson. But uh, yeah. one of the things that we were not able to do is, I think, just chug along consistently. We've we've done a lot of great things in, in different areas, but I almost wish we had uh, continued the seasons of BNP till now. That would have been crazy. I remember we tried it a little bit in, in, in Chinatown. Yeah. Well, it's never too late to start something like this, Henok. So this is your beginning here, the, the, this phenomenal show, which I know is going to do extremely well. This is uh, already doing very well. So this is exciting that hopefully this vehicle is the one that you carry on through many, many years. And it's, it's an honor to be a part of this. Uh, it Thank really you. Reminisce. About um, you, you, uh, you mentioned earlier of my full er name, you know, I mean, you could go ad infinitum, but mm -hmm. Henoke Nagash, and you clarified the Diabolist, and I appreciate that clarification. 
because you've met another Henok Elias Nagash before, the son of the Ethiopian musician Elias Nagash, who his father's name is the same as my father's name, and his name is the same as my name. And so to differentiate us, you have to go to the great grandfather. You have to say Henok Elias Nagash Awoka for me to be differentiated from him. Or you can say the Diabolist, like you said, without including my great grandfather. Can yes. you tell us uh, about who my my uh, name twin is and and maybe the environment in which you met him because I think that's a great segue to one of your other passions or interests. Certainly, Hannah, thank you for asking that question. For many of you that do not know as a hobby, as a simply as a recreational activity, sometimes I dabble with card tricks, coin tricks, just a little magic trick, so to say. I've been doing that for a long time since I was six years old. I, I just went back home to San Diego and found a journal of when I was six years old, saying I wanted to go to the magic shop, I love magic. Every day my magic was on my mind. And to this day, it, I often think about it as well. I am uh, very- Beautiful. Much, uh, was the journal in Espanol or in English? It was in English, actually, believe it or not. Phenomenal. I think, no, or was it in Spanish? Uh, I don't, no, in, in Spanish, in Spanish, because I do say that my favorite animal, I, if I were to be an animal, I'd be a dog, is what I put in that journal. Un perro, I believe it was. Um, but you know what? That's a good question. I'll have to double check. I, I do speak Spanish very well as well. Um, yeah. No, I just remember you had spent some time in, in Tijuana, Baja California. On my last episode with uh, Juan Atan, we were yeah. talking about how it's the most beautiful city in the world and how the greater Baja California is uh, a region that is close to your heart. Mm -hmm. Well, not as beautiful Addis Ababa. You know, my favorite city in all this world, beautiful land, is Addis Ababa, your hometown, Hannah, for giving birth to uh, such an important gentleman like yourself. So, uh, how yeah, shout out. There's how a many, lot of still. How, Sorry, how, many, how many times have you been to Addis Ababa? Can you count how many times? In? Uh, either 12 or 13 times in my life wow. I've been there. What yeah, happened? So I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Mm -hmm. And. Um, but I almost every summer for a while and then every other summer for a while. And then I took a three, four year break. And now it's been nine years since I've been back. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's incredible. And what happened? Do you remember what happened on the last trip? Yeah, man. Uh, to be honest, it was a, a weird paradoxical tension time because I was getting deeper into spirituality and religion. I was not attending mass at the time, but every week I went to the Wednesday night biblical service. Mm -hmm. I learned how to read it and write Amharic for the first time and bought my first Amharic Bible. And I used that to make myself literate rather than reading some silly sentences about how a pig dig and sig and fig and all this stuff. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, you know, I was turning up, you know, like multiple times a week. So right. it was an interesting precipice moment for me um right before my senior year of our, our senior year because you and i are the same year our senior year of college wow man so you were living it up over there you were having a good time by the way i just remember the journal was in spanish by the way that journal it was un mago perro it was all in spanish it was very I, I thought so i thought so and that's why i asked yeah it was all in spanish uh, but you were getting turned over there you were getting loaded in ethiopia Hannah. what was i mean i must imagine that it's a whole different party scene over there because you are with your people in many ways you are with, with does that change things when you're with your folks when you're parting or how, how does that differ from when yeah, you're there's, yeah there's nothing like it i mean the first and most obvious difference is it's africa it's a different currency and so everything is cheaper you know at the time i think you get like a a, a fifth of alcohol for what might be the equivalent of a dollar fifty or two dollars mm -hmm. you know in u.s currency and mm -hmm. so there's that aspect. There's also the aspect that everybody's trying to save money. So whenever you finish that bottle of alcohol, you have to return it or you pay extra. So oh. they, they recycle every bottle. So they, <laughs> they're really making that buck off of you. I didn't know that, man. That's smart. That's smart. Uh, yeah. That's beautiful. I've, I've been to Tanzania in Africa. I was in Tanzania there and uh, made it to Egypt as well. But I haven't, haven't really been to Addis Ababa and I'd love to go to I'd love country. to give you a tour one day. I believe there's still a YouTube video of you eating goat with the Maasai tribe out there. Th there's that phenomenal memory again, Hanno. Thank you for remembering that it was a very spiritual experience. Uh, even though uh, we went for community service, we ended up also going on safari and visiting Maasai tribes. It was very special, very, very special. Um, but overall, I mean, I got to tell you, Africa is a beautiful continent. If, if I had to choose... Uh, which country in Africa I'd like to live in, it'd be a very tough decision. Uh, well, also, Jack, the founder of Square and Twitter, yeah. was yeah. planning to live 
in Africa for 2020. And he actually yeah. visited Ethiopia, a lot of entrepreneurs out there. And a lot of people were guessing that he was going to choose Ethiopia. And it looked like he was leaning towards Ethiopia. And as soon as the pandemic hit is when he yeah. decided against it, is when he decided to stay stateside. But it was a most very real possibility that mm -hmm. Jack, such an important figure, was going to spend a year in Ethiopia. And I hope maybe he spends 2021 or 2022 in Ethiopia and gets to know it better. I saw him working yeah. with data scientists and entrepreneurs and a lot of people. And it, it touched my heart because I appreciate him. He catches a lot of flack from a lot of people. But I see him as a genuinely progressive person who grew mm. up around a lot of conservatives. And I think mm. that grounded him because he had to be able to empathize and not demonize people with different points of view and incorporate their points of view somehow in his program. And, and the Twitterverse and Square and Cash App are all programs where he has to, he has to include people from multiple partisans uh, and from multiple ideologies. So I really like that. But going back to an, an African man and, and where you met him, could you tell people who've never been how and when, you know, when things open up, they should visit the Magic Castle in Hollywood and what exactly is it? Uh, yes, thank you for asking that question, Hino. For those of you that do not know, the Magic Castle in Hollywood is a well-known club for magicians. Prior to me moving to Los Angeles, you simply read about the Magic Castle in magazines about magic. There were two main magazines growing up that I subscribed to at one point or another. One was Magic Magazine, the other one is Genie Magazine. Genie Magazine, by the way, is still being published in a digital version. So feel free to check out genie.com, I believe, uh, to find a subscription for Genie Magazine. In that magazine, the castle is often referenced. It is a point where magicians go visit. It is a very well-established institution of magic. It also happens to be a, a bar and a restaurant and a club of sorts. Uh, so if you are over the age of 21, feel free to visit, dine, enjoy the shows, and see the magic on the planet because the best magicians they do attend the magic castle and Hano has been in there and he himself has uh, walked in he was given actually uh, a coat to wear believe it or not he was clothed I was just going to ask you is there a required dress code <laughs> if you mind sharing that story Hano quickly how you were Drake yeah, man, I just, you know, I assumed that we we're in California where there's this tech culture that's anti-suit. You know, I was a part of uh, Biz House for a very short time, which is one of these co-working spaces. And I remember one of their policies was you can wear anything but a suit. And this mm -hmm. is the general tech culture, California, laid back, chill. So I was expecting it in this environment. But what I entered was a little bit of a curmudgeon -y, old money type of environment where they demanded that you be in a suit and they weren't about to let me in. So they gave me a, a loner coat and it looked ridiculous because I had like a white T-shirt on kind of like what I have right now with a with a coat, you know, but I, I did it, you know, because uh, long ago I had someone else on my program give the fuller context of the quote when in Rome. I don't know if you're familiar, but this was yeah. uh, St. Ambrose actually in the Western mm -hmm. Rite, very respected in the in the Roman Rite, which is your um, ancestral mm -hmm. background. And he was talking about obeying the fasting practices of wherever you go, the city that you go in, in mm -hmm. answering the question of, I believe Augustine, who was his, his spiritual child or son at the time, he said, when in Rome, fast as the Romans, basically. Observe the practices of wherever you go. So I, I went into the Magic Castle. I observed the Magic Castle, um, you know, policy. I, I, I was doing it through gritted teeth, but I did it nonetheless. I complied and I had a phenomenal time. I suggested to any, anybody to go. And what actually surprised me, and maybe you could clear this up for me, is towards the end of the free show that you and I had gotten because we were tardy and one of the people was extra generous with us, he was inserting what seemed to me to be his own comedy act along with the magic. Can you tell us the role of comedy in relation to magic and if they have any standalone comedy programs or if it's all just an amalgamation of comedy and magic? Great question, Hanok. They go hand in hand, really, in my opinion. Comedy and magic go hand in hand. Cer certainly, there you couldn't see stage manipulation shows that are completely silent and just play to music. There really isn't too much comedy there, but for the most part, when you're seeing a magician's routine, it will be comedic. It is a, in many ways, it's a comedian plus the added benefit of magic. Um, there are some specialist stand-up comics slash comedians, uh, magicians, excuse me. Harrison Greenbaum comes to mind. He's well known for doing a bit of stand-up comedy and 
infusing his magic. But for the most part, most acts are of a comedic nature. Are they exclusively stand-up? Uh, not entirely, not to perform at the Magic Castle. They do have to have an element of variety, whether it be magic. Sometimes you see juggling or, or stunt tricks, so to say, bar tricks, uh, pool tricks, things like that. that Diabloing? Uh, Diabloing uh, uh, could be. That's exactly right. Diabloing could be. Um, but that's a good point, comedy and magic. Now, the thing that I want to ask you, though, is what was um, – and by the way, thank you for wearing that jacket inside the castle. I know it's uh, not everybody – Thing, hey, it looked fresh on you, Hanno. One thing that I did want to bring up, though, is I know you, you're you a mediator as well, Hanno, and you've mediated uh, several scenarios. In fact, I remember your job as a mediator, uh, at, I believe it was at uh, here in Los Angeles, at downtown City Hall, potentially, or share Yeah, the- I, was in, I was in Stanley Mosque Courthouse in downtown. I've also worked in Downey. Um, yes. The vast majority of my cases were originally in Van Nuys and in Inglewood. But then yeah. also about half of them were in Stanley Mosque, and I did at least one day's worth in Downey. Unbelievable. There is one particular, speaking of memories and recollections, there's one particular recollection that I never witnessed that you simply shared it with me. And I'm curious if you could potentially convey that story to us of when this, you were doing your job, by the way, as you very well do. You're a master of following the rules, but you were simply trying to mediate a situation. And naturally, over the course of the mediation, uh, tempers flare up. There was certain, some emotions really got riled up that you ended up becoming the victim of some of the uh, intense anger that was seen in the mediating parties. Does that, does that bring in back any memories? And so, yeah, are you sorry? You had something else? No, no, no. I was just going to ask, you know, can you share that story with us? And how can we learn from that? I mean, from us. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing is, you know, my people always teach through illustrations. So Mm. I give you, uh, I'll try to paint a cinematic picture of an illustration I've seen before. There's an illustration of a monkey, a giraffe, an element, uh, excuse me, an elephant and a snake. And they're told to climb a tree Mm -hmm. as an exam. And the, the point of this illustration is to say that the rules of the game or the basis of your examination determines what you are measuring. So if you think that standardized testing, for which is being critiqued by this comic, is the only form of intelligence, then you're a fool and you're only testing for one type of intelligence. And there are so many types of intelligence and the, the neurodiverse are maybe some of the most prominent thinkers of all time because they've been able to think outside of the box. People have been critiquing Kanye to the recently for what they believe are his mental breakdowns, and they have not achieved half the achievements that he has. They are unworthy to untie his Yeezys, and they critique him. So why do I bring this up? I have a particular skill set, but that doesn't mean that the way that my skill set manifests is, you know, makes me better than anyone else in any shape, way, or form. Everybody has their own ways in which they do it. I think part of it for me is probably biological, but part of it has also been honed through my classes at the the law school of Pepperdine as well as in the clinical space in Van Nuys and Inglewood, like I said, mostly, but then later in Downey and in downtown. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was a volunteer mediator, which means I was not getting paid. I was doing this for class credit instead of a thesis at the time you could either write like a 50 page 100 page you know document or you can get experiential learning and i always found the experiential learning component to be the place where i learned the most yeah. more than just you know writing which is just theoretical i believe in practice over theory if if you have to pick between the two yeah. i think you start with practice and then you go to theory you don't go from theory to practice and that goes back to the nasim taleb skin in the game concept So Ta-Nehisi Coates, In Between the World and Me, which I reviewed with the California Caucus of College and University Ombuds Journal 2016, you can look that up, Between the World and Me book review. In that book review, I talk about this passage where Ta-Nehisi Coates is a black American writer, very famous, especially for the long form essay and for books. And his parents were atheist and they raised him atheist, Mm -hmm. but he's a proud black man. And the black people he grew up with are overwhelming religious, whether they're either an, a more conventional form of Muslim or whether they're a nation of Islam or one of these various black nationalist groups 
like the Hoteps or the Hebrew Israelites that recently uh, got their ideology mixed with Nick Cannon and got Nick Cannon into some trouble, oh. um, or whether they're Christians. So he was viewing Christian women and older older women and older men during the civil rights movement getting hosed down by state violence, by firefighters and police. Yeah. And he saw in them this otherworldly ability to stand in the face of injustice and to still forgive these people and to still have hope and to still have positivity yeah. and a good outlook. And he saw that and he said that he's a proud atheist, but he respects the otherworldly hope that he saw oozing out of their eyes. Mm. So I try to emulate that with my faith as well. And my faith drives me to seek peace and to pursue it, as the good book says. So I would be in a courtroom in civil law, in small claims court. So these are typically cases worth $10,000 or less. And it's the day of their litigation, their day in court. And the judge typically gives me about five minutes to make a pitch to everybody in the audience before he begins the, the caseload. And he says, listen to this man. And I am given an opportunity to tell people the benefits of mediation. I mm -hmm. tell people on the plaintiff side and on the defendant side why they would, why they would be better off. The defendant is better off because if they get any judgment against them, and in that uh, in that courtroom, the evidence standard is 51%, which is a very low evidence standard. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt like in, uh, in criminal law. It's not like 95%. It's just 51. And if the judge doesn't drink coffee that day, if they're a little pissed off by someone, you know, being a vexatious litigant or something like that and talking back to them, you know, they could change their mind real quick. That 51 is a very arbitrary number. And so I would tell the defendant, you never want a judgment against you because it could risk your credit. We could, we could damage your opportunities at trying to purchase a car, trying to purchase a house or any large payment that you would need credit for. And it's just a very shameful public display of all of your business. You don't need people listening to you. It's very public too. So you become Googleable. So people could Google your name and see this court case. And then you, you hear everybody seeing it. That's why the defendant shouldn't do it. The reason the plaintiff shouldn't do it is because when the plaintiff goes for the judgment, they could end up with zero dollars, which is the worst case scenario. And the plaintiff is not allowed to appeal the case and you don't get a lawyer for small claims. So you have no lawyer and you're not allowed to appeal it. And there's a chance that you get zero dollars. Whereas if you go and do a settlement agreement, you're guaranteed at least some money and um, you know you don't have to worry about an appeal or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I would I would go out in the corridor outside of the courthouse. So the only reason I would go into a courthouse, which I think is sick and nasty and disgusting, is to take people out of there. So yeah. I would, the, the judge would let me give a speech, and then I would walk outside, and I'd sit in the hall, and I'd just wait for people, and I'd just pitch them. As, and as they're talking to their uh, – they can't have a lawyer, so sometimes they'll have a paralegal. And they would they find shifty ways, you know, to get around and not having a lawyer thing. So they might be talking to some shifty paralegal or doing something else. And I would be going around pitching my case a second time because I made my pitch in front of all of them. Then I'm making a second pitch. So one of these times I caught these, uh, there was one couple and then one um, body shop for cars. And the body shop had held the car for a long time. Um, whether it's reasonable or not, whether it's legal or not, it's up for debate. I always tell people the judge is the decider of facts. For me, I used to tell them every time they bring up facts to me, I, I look at them and say, look, I'm not in the business of facts. I'm in the business of agreement. If you both agree the sky is blue and sign on the dotted line, then I've done my job. Well, my only job is to get you to degree, to make a peace and to avoid litigation, to avoid a judgment. And they would always be shocked by, by that, you know, that kind of uh, frankness, you know, when I tell them I'm not interested in facts and things like that. So at one point, the uh, the couple was very pissed that these people had run up a lot of charges on them. And so the body shop was trying to say that the couple owed them like $5,000. And I ended up getting the couple and them to agree that the body shop actually owed the couple like $2,000. And the, the way that happened 
<clears throat> is because a lot of the, the money was just running up the cost of like keeping the their car in in that spot and charging them for that every day when the people never really consented to doing that but they never really consented to not doing that so there was a lot of confusion about what exactly the facts were but what i remember specifically is that the woman in the couple was about this close to my face and she was so passionate about what was happening the the body shop person was about 10 15 feet away and the couple and i were sitting on the same small bench that was only you know large enough for the three of us yeah. and she was yelling at my face you know within you know 12 12 inches and yeah. uh she ran out of breath from yeah. yelling so hard Ooh, and she's like she's yeah. like wow that was cathartic she's like i've never been able to just yell at somebody's face for 10 minutes straight and they sit there motionlessly and she's like, you know, how much are they paying you? And I said, they're not paying me. I do this for free. And she's like, what? You must be lying. I said, no, no, I do this for the sake of peace and reconciliation and getting you out of court. And she was so moved by that, that she was willing to to sign, you know, pretty much any agreement. And I go back to the body shop and say, look, you don't want to be Googleable and all these things and talk to them. And they said, all right, we can, we can part with $2,000. And then they, they had them sign a written agreement and the judge stamped it and it became law. And that's how I participated in law. Goodness gracious, man. That's got to be the most impressive mediation. <laughs> so the lady was yelling at you from inches away from your face for like 10 minutes straight. What was she yelling? What, what exactly was she saying? She was just yelling, oh, my God, I didn't, I didn't let them have my car there. They said they were going to fix the car. Then they didn't answer my calls. They didn't answer my email. I showed up in person. Oh. It was a different guy. They said he was at lunch and da, da, da. And she just kept going. But literally... She was out of shape because, you know, a few minutes into it, I'm just like nodding. Yes, go on. And I'm just like super, I maintain my calm, tranquil demeanor. You know, I'm not, I'm not even like backing up. Like I'm here, I'm right here. I'm listening to you and I'm actively listening to you. I'm using the words you're using. I'm reframing to make sure that, you know, I'm listening to you. I'm not just nodding my head. I know what you're saying. I could repeat it back to you. So I'm Good. genuinely present. I'm in the moment. I'm listening to you. I empathize with you. I want you to get the money. No, oh, man, that is incredible. That is a, a very valuable skill. Handle. I remember I learned about this, by the way, because this was an article. There was a publishing about this particular case, wasn't there? Hannah? There it was published somewhere or it was there was this was recorded by somebody, whether it was the Pepperdine newspaper or maybe I, I, I don't recall this particular one. Um, so with overall the volunteer cases i had 60 cases and i settled 54 of them so that's a 90 percent settlement rate meaning each one ended in a written settlement agreement and some of them i more facilitated the writing and some of it you know i let them write it themselves and a couple of them were appeals cases so they actually had lawyers who wanted to get in and some of those documents got longer i always try to keep it short about eight of those cases were in Spanglish or full Spanish as well. One of those cases was in Amharic. My gosh, you are an exceptional mediator. There's no doubt about that. And you know what, it, that, that, article, that episode that you mentioned, it didn't say the explicit details, but it said that you were mediating and there was an episode where you, you got yelled at basically is where, where I was, I first read that I was like, holy smokes, and it's getting uh, yelled at mediating. Uh, Hanok, I gotta run at 7 p.m., but this has been really wonderful. Thank you. I just want to get before you go one last pitch for yeah. your balloon sculpting services. Can you tell people your experience serving people and please yeah. distinguish for us, you know, the services of uh, of a clown versus the professional services of a balloon sculptor? Well, thank you. If I, I once again, that's a, a hobby part time thing that I once in a while I do. Uh, I, I charge for uh, essentially attending somebody's event function, making balloon creations. It's a pleasure for me to make those. And so it's really more of a hobby and a part time. What I will suggest, though, if you guys are interested right now, it's an important topic. Gold and silver are taking off. Highly recommended. I recently got into the space due to this pandemic and several other things. But it's my um, next little venture learning about that. If you want to learn more about gold and silver, uh, reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to sit down and convert. And, and please give them your handle so they could see your balloon creations as well as reach out to you about gold and silver, which by the way, I've been plugging to Armando since yeah. I've I've known him because I've been a fan of Ron Paul, who's yeah. owned not only gold and silver, but who's owned gold and silver mines no for doubt. years. No doubt. I highly recommend uh, folks look into physical gold and silver at this unique time in, in history. There's never been a more important time in 
please do so. Active Talent Entertainment is the balloon handle. Active underscore talent under entertainment. A lot of unders. Uh, what is that? Under under tag or what is that? It's uh, the underscore. I think is right. Um, I, I can find it and and plug it in the video when I upload it as well. And we're gonna have to bring you back because there's so many topics we still have to explore in, in the realms of production. I really maybe will get you thinking about it now so you can answer more fully what you think of like when Hollywood comes out with the same movie at the same time, right? Because you you're, have this film background as well as this background in magic. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the illusionist versus um, the prestige. Yeah, great point. And uh, you can't forget, of course, we also have um, the phenomenal magic movie that is not too often talked about, the one with uh, Jim Carrey and Steve Carell, which uh, the great Burton, I believe it was, or Burt Wonderstone, excuse me, is the other one that was also coming out. Not in that same time, but that's another magic movie. Henok, absolutely, anytime, man. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me, and uh, I look forward to conversing with you further at another point in time. Thank you. Buenas noches, Pepperdine. Thank you.